Hi guys and welcome, Knembon here with a little tutorial how to use the carpet mod for Minecraft 1.11. What is a carpet mod? It's a set of additions to the game that help me design better and quicker farms and contraptions. So every time I thought I was missing some features or the game wasn't telling me information I needed, I went ahead and added them to the mod. The mod is only for servers, but in my previous video I showed how you can use it on your own computer with your single player worlds, and also how to install it, this doesn't change. The good thing about it is you can mix it with any vanilla compatible client side mod like Optifine for even better experience. Like in the previous version, all the changes you make to the world through this mod are only temporary. There is no information stored in the world, meaning you can load your world using vanilla game afterwards with no risk of world corruption, and if something goes really weird and you don't know what's going on, just restart it and everything should be back to normal. So I organized the features into two groups. First is all the features that should be available to all players, even those who don't use commands. These features don't change any settings, just query the game for useful information that it typically doesn't want to share with us. And for that, it uses carpets as a medium to ask these queries, hence the name of the mod. First is the pink carpet, which like in previous version of the mod, will tell all the information about what can spawn in this particular spot. So with this sky axis here, we can see that we can get sheep, pigs, chickens and cows spawning. Horses and donkeys would not spawn because they would not fit here because of this glass block. Other mobs, like the hostile mobs, would not spawn here because it's too bright. If you block the light, you might get zombies, zombie villagers, skeleton creepers, endermen and witches, along with their ratios and chances for successful spawn. It's pretty much the same as in the previous version of this mod. In case you cannot place a carpet because the block is obstructed by some other block, like an open trapdoor, in this case, you can use commands spawn, list, X, Y, Z, and learn that it doesn't prevent mobs from spawning, but we get reduced chances of them to spawn. Why? This is quite complicated, we can use some other carpet, but we'll go back to this in a moment. Second is the black carpet, which allows to get more insights about the entity count from the F3 debug screen. When placed, it will tell you what are the mob counts in each group. So we have here two cows standing on two shulkers up there, and both of these are reflected in the counts for each group. It also includes current mob cap limit, as well as how many times per tick this group is being attempted to spawn. Even in like game, it's only once per tick, but you can change it here using some more advanced capabilities of this mod. If you are curious where are these mobs, you can place black carpet on a specific colored wool representing each mob group. Hostiles, passive, water, which is squids, and ambient mobs, which is bats. So in this case, we can easily locate both shulkers and both cows. If you are an operator, you can just use the command spawn entities or spawn entities with a respective class to get the same information. Next is a brown carpet that will help you to measure distance between two points. Place the carpet on the starting point and then on the second point to get your distance measured using Manhattan metric, spherical, which is simply distance in a straight line between these two points, and cylindrical, which is the distance between these two points ignoring the different Y values. Useful to find a proper beacon range or, or a parameter size. There is an equivalent distance command, just point on the first spot and use tab completion, then repeat this command pointing at the second spot to get the same reading. You can then reuse this command to get a distance reading in different endpoints using the same starting point. The last of the carpet options is the grey carpet that gives the information about the block it is placed on, so the block below it. That's all the information I managed to collect, but if you think there is something worth adding about this block or this block position in general, please let me know so I can add it to the pack. For instance, the lowered spawn chances of a mob in a trapdoor from the beginning can be explained with the fact that the trapdoor would borrow a higher light value from its neighbors, and thus lowering spawn chances by increasing light level by 1 in that spot. Of course, there is an accompanying command, block info, where you specify the actual coordinates of the block you want to test, not the block above it. Now the rest of the commands, the one you would need an operator status to run them, since they change the behavior of the game, but only temporarily, until the next restart. First is the temporal command, it's like game rule but it's not saved in the game files. Quasi connectivity, by default turned on, extended connectivity, by default turned off, and 1.8 spawning, by default off. Turning 1.8 spawning brings back pack spawning rules and inability of mobs to spawn in the same place. You can use this rule if you want to evaluate some mob farm designs from 1.8 and before and be able to compare them with newer designs. Spawning have changed since then and this allows to bring old spawning rules back. Now, Quasi-connectivity is the ability of pistons, droppers and dispensers to be powered by the block that would power the block directly above them. 
So these bottom pistons are extended because they are notified about their powered status by the pistons above them. However, this one did not get notified so it won't extend. This is a useful mechanic that because of the assumption it makes, it may lead to weird situations like this one where some pistons, droppers and dispensers would not react properly to the change in power. If we turn off quasi-connectivity, all blocks would only be able to be powered directly, like so. And if we turn on extended connectivity with quasi-connectivity on as well, then the game will send extra updates making sure that all blocks are properly notified. But it will also mean that there is no way to turn pistons, droppers and dispensers into the incorrect state. I put these options into the carpet mod mainly to allow for you to test things out. Next is the spawn mob cap command, where we can change the default mob cap sizes for the game. The default is 70 mobs per player, assuming the area they load does not overlap. Many different farms and contraptions is limited by this number, and to test how it would behave with many players logged in, you need many players' accounts, but you can use this command to increase these mob caps as well. Now, the 70 is the default for hostile mobs, but it would control all other groups as well. For instance, default number for bats allowed on the server is 15, and if I change the hostile mob caps to 140, simulating the other players have logged in, this would increase the mob cap for bats as well. Now is the spawn rates command where you can adjust how many times a particular group is attempted to spawn. By default each group is selected once for spawning for each chunk, that's why we have the ones next to each group. By using spawn rates followed by some mob group name, we can change each group separately either to zero or some other higher number. To bring them all back to normal, we can just type spawn rates reset. I'll show in a moment how we can use it in certain scenarios to test mob farm performance. Spawn mocking, when turned on, will disable spawn mobs to actually show up in the world, so the spawning algorithm will work, but it will simply not place mobs in the world. Why you will need it? Because of the next command. Spawn tracking allows to track mob spawns, allowing to gather statistics how much of them would spawn, and keeps track of the last 10 mobs from each category that have spawned. To enable it, type spawn tracking start, and from now on the game would remember all the mobs that have spawned naturally. At any point we can check the spawn statistics typing spawn tracking, and then spawn tracking followed by any mob group will show you 10 recent spawns with their location, useful in making perimeters and making sure nothing can spawn. At this point the role of black carpet changes to display the spawn statistics. You can stop everything by typing spawn tracking stop. We'll discuss the content of the spawning report and how to use it in practice in a moment, but before that one more tool. It's a tick command. It does and it doesn't what you would expect from it. The tick rate will change the tick rate on the server that runs on default 20 ticks per second. You can change it to any number from a fraction to a thousand. Like this one, I can slow the game significantly, but because we are on a separate client, we are not affected by the tick rate difference. And we can interact with the components as we want. On the higher end, the basic game event loop limits us to max 1000 ticks per second, and this might not be achievable depending on the how intensive is the world we have just created. But there is another option, much more interesting if I may say so myself, which is tick warping. For that you need to specify the number of ticks we want to warp, and during that time the game will not wait between ticks altogether and will try to run those ticks as fast as it can. Right now we achieved about 450 ticks per second, which is decent. So what the game has to do is process these cows and shulkers over there, plus these hoppers here and me, the player. However, on top of that the game tries to spawn mobs from all four groups, and that's what slows it down. And not all groups count equally. Passive mobs take 400 times less CPU than other mobs, but squids and bats are as expensive to spawn as all other hostile mobs. It is important if you want to save on CPU to turn on features that we don't use or don't test. In this case we can disable spawning altogether using a built-in game rule do mob spawning, but with spawn rates command we can disable them selectively for bats and squids first, And now our average tick time will decrease to below 1 millisecond, and we have 1000 ticks per second, and this with hostile mob spawning. If we disable them as well, we'll get 5000 ticks per second easily in this world. And that's what it takes to process me, cows, shulkers and this hopper clock. 
So let's check how fast you can go. We are now in the most like friendly flat world and it is not the void but the world with 15 layers of bedrock. Mobs can't spawn on bedrock and most spawn attempts within the first sub chunk are voided because of the solid blocks. I also moved the spawn to 0, 0 where I am so only one area is processed at a time. This with the default settings allow us to reach 5000 ticks per second. And it is with mob spawning. If we disable mob spawning altogether we reach whopping 10,000 ticks per second. So what we can do with it? We can test stuff without waiting. And we can test pretty much anything that doesn't require user active participation. We can test for example how laggy are really infamous hoppers by filling 100 by 100 area with them. More than 10,000 hoppers brings the ticks down to 170 ticks per second. What if you add Fernay above them? Now, a furnace will disable a hopper checking for items, but it itself is a ticking tile entity, meaning we doubled on the blocks game has to check on each tick. We get a very small improvement to about 200 ticks per second. But what if we replace Fernai with Drop Pie, which is a container, but doesn't tick? We got 240 ticks per second, so it's better than with a furnace. Let's see something else, a simple sugarcane farm, very crude design, with a hopper clock triggering them pistons every few minutes or so. To test it, we'll make sure mob spawning is turned off, and normally we would AFK for let's say about an hour, or an hour is 72,000 ticks, so let's do that. What did we get? 21 sugarcane, crap. The thing is, we didn't need to wait for one hour for the result, so that's cool. Now test to find uh, can we mix carrots and potato villager in automatic potato and carrot farms. We have here a hungry rubbish villager that is stuffed with seeds, so he cannot pick up anything else. And two other guys. First has a stack of potatoes and the rest are seeds, and the other has a stack of carrots and the rest are seeds. The fact is that mixing crops increase their growth time, so in theory this field should produce as much crop as two fields of the same size, one with carrot villager and one with the potato villager. This design will save us some space, providing they will not start planting the same crop at the same time at some point. Now, they will be dropping some food to the hungry villager at the bottom and leaving some leftover crops on the ground, which are then picked up by the hopper minecart. So if one of them drops most of his stuff to the guy in the middle and then will have a really bad luck and harvest only crops of one type, he may lose his first inventory slot and start picking up other crops, making this field a monoculture. Normally we would run these tests for hours and hours, but with tick warp function we can speed it up. Let's do 10 hours first, which should take about 4 real life minutes, which I'll speed up for you. Let's try another 10 hours. And you can see that at some point one of them lost all their potatoes and the field have changed into a monoculture. So this concept mixing carrots and potatoes while cool wouldn't really work that well in practice. More complex problem is to evaluate the passive mob farm from the Cycraft server. In my last video I posted results from this farm of over one year of AFKing and it took me about one hour to do so. And we'll see today how we can use this mod to get these numbers. First, we will disable squid, ambient and hostile mob spawning. This will disable the slimes, but that's fine as they don't interfere with the passive mob spawning. Now after we did all of that, we will disable mobs showing up once they spawn by enabling mocking. Doing that without disabling squid spawning first would be a disaster because all of the ocean surround us. Since the farm sends all the animals to the nether at each spawning cycle, we can increase spawning rates drastically to let's say 1000 uh, spawns per try. Without mocking turned on, this would also crash the server by spawning couple thousand animals in the first try. But now we are relatively safe to do so. After releasing the water, spawning can actually happen by freeing all the spawning spaces. The server spawns passive mobs 1000 times every 400 ticks, meaning it pointlessly waits in between. We can speed up these ticks by using tip warping feature. So let's start tracking and warp forward half of the Minecraft day, so 12,000 ticks. We can now see how the game slows down for this one tick when animals are being spawned just by looking at the beacon beams. 
So in about a minute we got results from about 10,000 minutes of AFKing, which is about 7 days worth of AFKing on a regular farm. So that was your comprehensive introduction to the carpet mod for Minecraft 1.11, which should help you in designing farms and stress testing contraptions in a fast and efficient way. At the end, I would like to encourage you to explore it, as there is one easter egg in this mod, a hidden feature I haven't included in this introduction, and it involves an elytra. You can check my previous video of the Cycraft log with the making of this farm behind me for a little hint of what this might be, and I bet you it's really interesting. Downloads of this mod are in the description. In my first Carpet Mod introduction video I included a simple tutorial how to install it yourself. Just make sure that you really unpack the original 1.11 server jar file, replace all the files from the patch in the unpacked directory, and then pack it up again using a simple zip packager like 7-zip. I know that some of you had troubles with a built-in max zip packager that adds some additional stuff that breaks the jar file. So if you like it, leave me a like, share with others, and let me know in the comments below, especially if you find what the easter egg is I was talking about. And see you in the next one. Bye bye!